Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. You may have seen the news yesterday that MIT researcher Katie Bowman produced the first image of a black hole. What's been less reported is that the algorithm she developed to accomplish this is based on machine learning. Machine learning is having a huge impact in the fields of astronomy and astrophysics, and I'm excited to bring you interviews with some of the people innovating in this area. Today we're joined by Yasher Hazabe, Assistant Professor at the University of Montreal and Research Fellow at the Center for Computational Astrophysics at Flatiron Institute. Yasher and I caught up to discuss his work on gravitational lensing, which is the bending of light from distant sources due to the effects of gravity. In our conversation, Yasher and I discuss how machine learning can be applied to undistort images, including some of the various techniques used and how the data is prepared to get the best results. We also discuss the intertwined roles of simulation and machine learning in generating images, incorporating other techniques such as domain transfer or GANs, and how he assesses the results of this project. For more of our astronomy and astrophysics coverage, be sure to check out the following interviews. Twimmel Talk number 117 with Chris Shalou, where we discuss the discovery of exoplanets. Twimmel Talk number 184 with Viviana Aquaviva, where we explore dark energy and star formation. And if you want to go way back, Twimmel Talk number 5 with Joshua Bloom, which provides a great overview of the application of machine learning in astronomy. I'll be sure to link to these episodes in the show notes. I'd like to thank everyone who entered our AI conference and TensorFlow Edge device giveaways. Today, I'm excited to announce the winner of our AI conference giveaway, Mark T from Indiana. Mark, I'm looking forward to seeing you in New York next week. Today's show is sponsored by our friends at Pega Systems. PegaWorld, the company's annual digital transformation conference, will be held at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas from June 2nd through 5th. I'll be attending the event as I did last year and am looking forward to presenting again. In addition to hearing from me, the event is a great opportunity to learn how AI is being applied to the customer experience at real Pegasystems customers. As a Twimmel listener, you can use the promo code TWIMMEL19 at pegaworld.com for $200 off of your registration. Again, that code is TWIMMEL19. Hope to see you there. Enjoy. All right, everyone. I am on the line with Yasher Hezave. Yasher is an assistant professor at the University of Montreal and a research fellow at the Center for Computational Astrophysics at Flatiron Institute. Yasher, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Sam. Thank you very much for inviting me. Let's start by talking a little bit about your background. You recently joined University of Montreal as an assistant professor, uh, but tell us a little bit about the arc of your studies and research. Yeah, so I'm an astrophysicist, and uh, for most of my research career, I've been primarily doing research in and astrophysics. I did my uh, undergrad in physics and astrophysics at the University of Victoria in Canada, and then my PhD at McGill University in Montreal. I, I got my PhD in 2013, and I moved to Stanford as a Hubble Fellow until recently. I just moved from Stanford about three months ago. And during this whole period of, uh, you know, 10 years, uh, you know, in, uh, as a, you know, graduate student and a researcher, I've been working on specifically astrophysical data analysis. And, and, uh, and in the past couple of years, you know, with all the, you know, buzz about machine learning, I've kind of like uh, started, you know, to look into the application of machine learning methods to astrophysical data analysis. And so now a good fraction of my research has kind of like, you know, focused on, 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 on developing new machine learning methods for the uh, analysis of uh, astrophysical data, so like telescope data. And your particular research area is focused on uh, strong gravitational lensing. What's that? Strong lensing is the uh, a distortion in the images of uh, distant objects uh, done by the gravity of intervening object structures. So just uh, think about it that, you know, gravity actually bends light. So here on the Earth, we don't notice it because 
it's such a tiny effect that, you know, you don't notice it. But in reality, you know, if you had a flashlight and, you know, this flashlight, the light rays, instead of going like straight, they would actually bend a little bit because of the gravity of the earth. It's the same reason that black holes are black because they can they absorb all this light because the light falls into the black hole. Uh, so at cosmological distances, you can have two galaxies, one sitting far away, say 5 billion light years from us, and a second galaxy could be like much farther away, say 12 billion light years, but right behind this middle galaxy. So we have this scenario, it's us, a galaxy, we call it the middle galaxy, we call it like the foreground and a background galaxy. And so the light rays of that background galaxy, as they come and they pass near the foreground galaxy, they get bent, they get deflected because of its gravity. And so they come to us from these different angles, different directions because of, you know, this bending of light. And as a result, what happens here is that here on the Earth, we see these distorted images of that background galaxy that look like rings and arcs around the middle galaxy. So you can have, you know, instead of like one galaxy completely being in front of the other one, you would see one galaxy and around it, you would see these rings and arcs which are actually the images of the distant background galaxy. And so how does the use of machine learning play into uh, your study of these, these lensing effects? So there are two things. So, so uh, to give you an uh, analogy about this, you know, I, I like to make an analogy to lensing of a candle flame with a wine glass. So think about it, you know, you have a candle sitting on a table and you have a wine glass. If you look at the candle flame through the foot of the wine glass, you can see that the image of the flame kind of wraps around the foot of the wine glass and it makes like rings around that thing. So that's why this is called gravitational lensing because it, it acts, you know, the, the middle galaxy likes, acts like a lens. And so this is kind of the thing that we have. And we usually have two questions in each of these, uh, for each of these observations. The first thing that we want to figure out is what is the shape of the foot of the wine glass? What is the distortion that is caused to the image? And so this relates to, you know, how much matter there is in the middle galaxy. So we are trying to use these image distortions to learn about how matter, you know, to map the distribution of matter in these lensing galaxies. And then the second question is that, so I see a distorted image of this background source, but what does it truly look like? You know, if I'm looking this, arc that is a stretched out image of the candle flame. Uh, I'm interested to know what, what does the candle flame truly look like? How could I undistort this image? And so you can see that all of this kind of relates to image analysis and e image processing. So, uh, so um, one thing that, you know, works really well, you know, for us is, you know, this development of convolutional neural networks that are specifically tailored to image uh, analysis problems. And so we've been kind of like, you know, hijacking them and using them for this application to answer these two questions. You know, if I get a, a, a distorted image of these background things, can I predict what, you know, the distortion is that's been caused to it? And can I undistort, can I reconstruct the true image of this background galaxy? And so what are some of the uh, techniques that you're using to do this? So... Traditionally, this is done uh, by something called, like, I'll just throw the name and I'll explain what it is, you know, using like maximum likelihood lens modeling. So the way that this works is that you say, well, uh, let's think about this. I have this, you know, candle in the background. I'm putting a lens in front of it. So I see this distorted image, you know, magnified image of the candle. And, and I have an observation. So I see that image. But I neither know what that candle truly looks like, nor do I know what is the distortion that's been added to its image, right? So, so I, I, if I see the, the data, I cannot predict these two together. But what I can do is that I can produce a lot of simulations. So if you gave me an image of a candle and you gave me a lens, it's easy to simulate it and say, you know, because you can go from one to the other. So I can get a lens and predict what is the distortion that it causes to space, and then I can put the image of the candle and I can make a simulation. So say, you know, a, a, a lensed image, a distorted image of the candle would look like that. Um, it's, the problem is that, you know, it's difficult to undo this. Uh, so the way to solve traditionally has been that, you know, I would just produce a lot of different simulations with like, you know, perhaps random candles and random lenses and try to find out which one of them really looks like the data. 
And so if I find one simulation that really looks like the data, you know, I can kind of infer that the parameters that I assume for it, you know, the background source that I assume for it, the foreground lens that I assume for it, should be uh, kind of a correct description of their, you know, reality. And so this kind of like falls into this, you know, general umbrella of like, you know, uh, inverse problems where it's easy to go from the ingredients of the model. Like if I knew the truth about the truth about the candle and the lens, I can go forward and make a simulation. But the inverse problem is difficult. If I if you gave me the output, then I cannot figure out, you know, what was the initial ingredients that it was made from. Uh, so with machine learning, what is exciting about it is that we can construct these inverse, you know, mappings. So but using a lot of simulated data or true data, I can learn to just kind of like directly predict what these background sources or the foreground lenses look like just directly looking at the data without the need to produce in a lot of simulations for every data analysis. In describing the, the simulation-based approach, there's something kind of intuitively unsatisfying about that, the idea that you're going to just randomly generate a bunch of candles and randomly generate a bunch of lenses. And if you get something that kind of looks like uh, or looks very close to the result that you've got, you assume that it's that specific lens and candle configuration. Is it that the the chance that you get a good match, you know, without the candle and the lens being exactly right or, or close, so small that that gives you comfort in choosing that uh, particular configuration or... I guess there's yeah. part of me that says, you know, there could be any number of configurations of candles and lenses that. Yeah, uh, that, that's, gonna... a, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, the, the, so, so, so in a statistical way, what you really do is that you would say, uh, I'm actually going to find out every candle and every lens that will kind of produce. So there might be, as you said, there might be like multiple answers and I'm going to find every one of them that will match the data within my uncertainties. And so it means that you have to have a statistical uh, description of your data to understand your, what are your uncertainties. These uncertainties could, could come from, for example, noise. And you would write a statistical model to say, well, this particular candle and this particular glass, it fits my data to some, you know, you know in a probabilistic way. So, and this other one could also match it. And that's one of the things that makes it even more difficult because the problem is not only even finding a single answer. The problem is that now you have to kind of explore all the different answers and kind of give a range of these answers that are consistent with the data. So it works well. It's just that computationally, it's very expensive because now it means that you have to try millions and millions of these simulations to give an answer for one specific data set. And what are you assuming as as known in the way you've formulated the problem here is you kind of know what a candle looks like and you know what a lens kind of looks like how like how what assumptions are you making about the the candle and the lens is, yeah continue the analogy. Uh, that's again that that's a really good question so these assumptions typically in the language of you know statistical analysis, you would call them priors. So these are the prior information, the prior knowledge that we have about these things. And so the way that these priors are specifically encoded in the analysis could be different from, you know, mildly different. But you can imagine that, for example, in the case of strong lensing, you want the background source to be something looking like a galaxy, you know, so you would impose some sort of like, you know, prior knowledge, you would say, I have a prior knowledge that the background source, you know, is a galaxy. So for example, when I make images of this thing, I will, you know, kind of enforce that, for example, it is, uh, you know, it's blobby or it's concentrated at the center or that, you know, it's peaks, you know, its density at this, you know, its brightness at the center. But the way that you define it could be uh, tricky. And specifically when you were doing uh, these, you know, feet, the kind of like forward, mod, you know, lens modeling procedures, it is difficult to, to actually, um, specify these priors. One of the cool things about machine learning is that these prior information, you can actually learn them from data itself. And that's one of the really like great advantages of a machine learning approach is that if I had a large data set of these lenses or galaxies in general, if I think that the background source is a galaxy, I can get uh, millions of 
images of other galaxies in the universe from you know all sorts of telescopes and i can put it through a machine learning procedure and i can actually learn what are the kind of structural priors that i need to respect and then try to kind of like find out what are the solutions within that uh kind of like you know range of you know possibilities that match this particular data set uh and so maybe Share a little bit about the data collection and preparation aspect of uh, these types of problems. Assuming the data that you're working with comes from these you know, large radio telescopes and you're able to collect that very fairly readily, but you have to do a lot of processing to it? Yeah, so we work both with uh, uh, radio telescopes and, and, and regular optical telescopes like you know, Hubble Space Telescope. So two of the first like machine learning papers that we wrote were basically just uh, using, you know, Hubble Space Telescope images. So uh, these images, uh, usually there's like a few steps of pre-processing that you need to, to do with it. The telescope that comes, you know, from the, uh, the, the image that comes from the telescope uh, might, for example, have uh, a lot of cosmic rays. These are just like, uh, particles you know in around the earth that hit the you know the the cameras on the telescope and they just leave these traces very high energy particles and so you know you might need to remove those uh you might need to uh for example subtract the light from the lensing galaxy itself because remember what we're interested in is the distortion of this background galaxy and how it's been distorted one of the nuisance things here is that the middle galaxy that is distorting also has a lot of stars. So it has a lot of light that's added to this image. And so a lot of times you would try to kind of subtract this light first and, and then kind of like look at the remaining, the arcs that come from the background source. So how do you do that? Uh, you know, you might take advantage of the fact that the background galaxy and the foreground galaxy have different colors. And so use the color information from these things. Uh, you might need to uh, estimate uh, uh, what is the blurring of the telescopes. So the images are never perfectly sharp. There's some amount of blurring that's your resolution. So if you have a bigger telescope, you know, big, better camera on it, uh, you're going to get sharper images. So that's kind of the, the blurring of the telescope or the point spread function. So you might want to you know, estimate that for the analysis and all of these things. So when you're doing uh, for for, in, for Radio data, it's kind of different things. Uh, but uh, typically, there's a lot of these like steps and pre-processing steps that you need to do before you even move on to that final stage where uh, we're actually doing these simulations and comparing them to the data. I got the impression earlier that the simulation was kind of the way you used to do it, and now you're using machine learning as an alternative. Is that it sounds like that's not the case. You're, you're using the simulations and machine learning together uh, kind of in conjunction with one another to solve this problem. Is that right? Yeah, so, so their roles have kind of changed. Uh, uh, so in, the, so in, a, in, a, in, in what I call like maximum likelihood lens modeling, just you know, lens modeling in a traditional way, uh, if, I, if you gave me a specific data set, you know, one image of a gravitational lens, and I wanted to analyze it, I need to produce you know, millions of simulations and one by one compare them to the data. And then based on that comparison, I will pick my next simulation to produce. So you know, there is a systematic kind of you know, way to kind of like go through these simulations and just say, well, this one is not good in this particular way. So the next simulation that I need to produce will look to be, you know, will have to be something that looks like this, that kind of looks, looks like this or whatever. That's kind of the correct you know, direction for me to go. Uh, so, and then once you're done with that procedure, so let's say you got your answer and you say, well, these are the ranges of answers from, you know, background candles and the foreground lenses that are consistent with the data. Uh, so you move on, the next day you come and you have a new example, a new data set from a new telescope, and you want to get the answer. So you need to go through the whole thing one more time. So you need to produce like millions of simulations again for this specific system to analyze it. With machine learning, what we do is that we produce a lot of these simulations in one go, we train a machine learning model, and then we're done forever. Because this machine learning model from all these simulations in one go, it learned how to do that mapping, how to get, how to predict these parameters that we were interested in from the data set. And then so I can apply to this data set and then tomorrow I can apply to another data set and I never ever have to run another simulation again. 
So we're using the same sort of simulations to train the machine learning methods, but we only need to do it once. Returning to the machine learning models that you're using to predict the lensing, you know, one of the things that kind of immediately comes to mind when I think of imaging or, or processing images is deep learning and convolutional neural nets. Is that a part of the solution here? Yeah, yeah. So we're using a lot of deep learning and convolutional neural nets for the analysis of these data. That's right. Is what the simulation is doing is allowing you to kind of set up standard supervised learning training of CNNs or is there, is that the right way to think of what you're doing? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So what we're doing is that we're producing training sets where, uh, so I can, I can, for example, pick, you know, a particular image of a background galaxy and I pick, you know, a galaxy that's doing the lensing, the lensing galaxy with certain parameters, for example, it's ellipticity or how massive it is or, you know, where it is in the sky. And uh, so I know the truth because this is a simulation. It's a control simulation. So I know what the truth is and I will produce an image. And so then I will put this image as the input of my convolutional neural network and train it to predict the particular outputs that, that I have, because this is yeah, supervised training, because I know what the truth is for this particular case. And so this is, you know, one of the approaches that we've done for this is, is exactly that for just training sets from simulated data and, and train convolutional neural nets uh, in a supervised way with, with these things. Okay. And uh, the reason that we use simulations, by the way, one of the things to say is that there are two reasons why we use simulations. One is that we could produce really realistic looking simulations. So, uh, and so in a really realistic looking simulation, the good thing is that the labels that we have, the truth that we have, are the absolute truth because these are actually producing a you know controlled simulation. So whereas if I actually get a realistic you know a real data set from the sky that has been analyzed, the prediction for that itself has some error in it depending on various parameters. And the second thing is that currently we only know of a few hundred gravitational lenses altogether. So strong gravitational lenses altogether. So uh, we probably know of about like you know something of order of like 500 lenses, which is really really not enough. Uh, for training these like large deep networks. Uh, so when we were doing simulations, we would produce like half a million of these things and it would only take like, you know, about a day to produce this. And so that gives us, you know, a lot of data set to avoid, you know, issues like overfitting. Do you find that the models that you produce as a result of this uh, simulation and training process apply well to real world images or do you need to incorporate something like domain transfer or some of these other techniques? Uh, yeah, we do. So, so, so this, the lensing simulation aspect of it itself is fine. It's just that uh, telescopes usually have a lot of funny things happening to them. So there's, you know, various forms of noise. Uh, there could be cosmic rays, like what I described earlier. There could be various sort of noise. So, uh, in various the first, forms of noise and, oh, you mentioned the cosmic rays? Yeah, so cosmic rays is another kind of like, you know, corruption that happens to the data. So the first time that we tried this on real data, that, that's what happened was that we trained it, you know, as CNN, and then, and then we uh, looked at its predictions for real data for the first time. And we knew the answer for this real data set because we had modeled it before. So we had a kind of a rough comparison and we're like, it, it, it's, you know, the answer was complete garbage. And so what we did is that we took these saliency maps, which means that we took kind of like, we looked at the gradient of our predictions with respect to the data set. So anywhere in the data that is, you know, making a huge contribution to our decision for what the truth, you know, what the, what the prediction is, it would kind of like, you know, shine bright. And immediately we noticed that anywhere that there was a hint of, kind of like a low intensity kind of dot in the image. These are cosmic rays that kind of like, you know, put kind of like a dot or, you know, imprints in the images. It was shining bright. And we were like, oh, okay. Like that's kind of a sign that, you know, all these other corruptions that are in the data do really ha impact the decisions of the CNN. So uh, the challenging aspect was exactly that, that domain adaptation to, to try to, or, you know, in this case, like we, Really simulate, you know, realistic-looking images that were in every aspect uh, representative of the data that we were going to analyze. 
Another technique that comes to mind for this type of a problem, it sounds in, in many ways to some of the problems like, um, you know, correcting missing pixels and or distortion in photographic images is generative models. Is that something that you've been looking at for this problem? Uh, we have been discussing this, but we haven't, we haven't done anything about it. So in terms of the generative part of this problem, there's like uh, two uh, two parts of it that could be uh, very interesting. So the first one is the background sources. So the background source that's being lensed is the image of an actual a real galaxy. So the thing that we did so far was that we actually got a bunch of a large data set of real images of galaxies. And so these are from different, you know, these are galaxies that are not strong with lens. So some of them are galaxies, you know, in the local universe, you know, we have Im beautiful images from the Hubble Space Telescopes. Some of them are more distant galaxies in the universe. But you know, we got like you know, 100,000 images of galaxies and then we put those through simulations and made these arcs and you know, lens them. Uh, but you know, we were still limited you know, by this data set. So one thing is that, that we've been discussing is using these generative models to produce an unlensed image of a galaxy, just produce a, an image of a galaxy and then putting that through a simulation lens it. Hmm. So for the lensing aspect of it, you could also do this. You can imagine that, well, I'll just train a generative model that produces a lens image to begin with. Uh, well, the thing about that is that the lensing aspect of things is easy, is relatively easy. You know, it just involves running something called a ray tracing simulation, uh, which is not the most efficient thing in the universe, but it's not too bad. It's, it's not the bottleneck. And, um, but then the third aspect of it that could also get interesting with generative models is exactly the point that you brought up uh, about all the other sorts of corruptions that goes into data. Uh, you know, can I produce a generative model that actually uh, gets these simple stimulations and adds the various effects of, you know, different instruments and telescopes and gives me images that are representative of that so that I use it for training of the other machine learning methods like the CNNs. How do you kind of envision the future application of machine learning in the space? You know, obviously we just talked about some of the generative models and the applications of, of those techniques, but are there other areas that you see uh, as being interesting ones to explore here? Oh yeah, so this is becoming, you know, kind of a popular topic in astrophysics now. There are a lot of uh, young people looking into the application of this for, for different things. Uh, you know, there are so many things in astrophysics that you could kind of like use a neural network to, to answer the question. But uh, it's, it's really uh, the question of, you know, is, is it particularly useful in this particular, you know, case? Uh, so one thing that really made it you know, worth it for us was that uh, in the next few years, we're expecting to discover about 200,000 strong gravitational lenses. There are a few new surveys uh, that are planned to, uh, uh, to, to be operational. So like LSST is, uh, is, is, is a huge project and uh, Euclid Telescope, you know, it's a European satellite. So these are expected to be uh, surveys. So they will like map huge chunks of the sky. LSST in particular will map the whole sky, the, the visible part of the sky every three nights and it will produce, you know, a ridiculous amount of data. And we're expecting to discover a forward of like, you know, 200,000 lenses. Now, with my traditional methods, if I wanted to go and fit a lens model to every one of these, you know, 200,000 lenses, even if it took me like, you know, two, three days to come up with the answer for one lens, which is optimistic, actually, uh, you know, it would take me like 14, you know, 100 years uh, to do that. Uh, so for... Strong lensing, it really looks like, you know, it's just like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of speed and, uh, and, uh, and the number of lenses that we have to analyze. Uh, there, so in other fields, like, you know, in uh, imaging of the cosmic microwave background, there are, there are, you know, papers being written right now, people looking into, you know, at the application of machine learning. But, you know, for example, in that field, uh, the problem is not really speed. Uh, it's sometimes about accuracy and could you train neural networks that can be more accurate than these maximum likelihood methods because they can deal with, you know, complex noise, for example. Uh, so, um, 
but my general feeling is that you know it's 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 becoming an active field in astrophysics, and more and more people are uh, getting excited about it. Like you know, when I started giving talks about this, like you know, two years ago, uh, I kind of saw you know some level of skepticism, uh, primarily because you know people have, have this worry that these are black boxes and you know you cannot control exactly what happens. You don't understand why they're making the decisions that they're making. But as you know, people have seen the results of, you know, the, the excellent performance of these methods. I think now more and more people are kind of like warming up to the idea and kind of a lot of research is, is going that way. Awesome. And, and maybe a quick note before we close out, uh, you mentioned the excellent performance of these methods in your case, where you're looking at gravitational lensing, how do you characterize that performance and what are the types of results you've seen? So for us, there's, there, there's been uh, kind of like two uh, kind of metrics of performance. Uh, and the most important one has been speed. And uh, so when we train a neural network, you know, the training itself takes just like a couple of days. And after that, you know, for the estimation of his parameters of a single lens, you know, it would take us a hundredth of a second on a single GPU. And if you assume that the analysis of, you know, a lens of a typical complexity would take, you know, a few days, uh, you know, of an actually like expert's time that, you know, would have to sit on this and run, you know, quite a few CPUs. It's something about, you know, 10 million times improvement in analysis speed. Uh, so, you know, the analysis of the LSSC data set that I discussed with you earlier. So uh, this could be done in half an hour on a single laptop, which is completely like orders of magnitude, you know, faster than whatever you would uh, get from uh, traditional modeling. And then in terms of the accuracy of the models themselves, you know, we're showing that you can get accuracies uh, that are within basically the uncertainties of the parameters. So we can get excellent accuracies on these predictions. So Remember that we were actually looking at the answers that we were saying, well, I'm in interested about a range of answers that match my thing. And so the precision of these models are, are really comparable to the, you know, kind of the uncertainties that we get from maximum likelihood modeling anyways. And the other thing is that in, there are certain cases where they can actually outperform these methods. So another direction we've gone is recently we're using recurrent neural networks. So these are networks that are typically used for, uh, you know, speech analysis because they're good at modeling sequences of data. Uh, what we're teaching them here is actually try to model a sequence of steps in these images. So ima ima you know, imagine, so we're interested in, for example, predicting uh, the distribution of matter in the lensing galaxies. And so we'll start from, you know, an unknown guess, uh, something, you know, a random guess. So we don't know what it is. And we'll have to take a series of steps to get to closer to our answer. So maybe the first guess is gonna be that this galaxy, you know, looks like something, you know, it has some uh, ellipticity in some direction and some mass. And then I will refine my answer as I go. And so we're putting this through a recurrent neural network that, you know, so this particular architecture is called the recurrent inference machine. And so the recurrent inference machine every time looks at its own prediction and then I, and then puts that through our simulation that uses the actually like physical model and updates its answer. And one thing that we've been showing is that this can actually like, you know, predict background source images, so D lens or D uh, undistorted image of the background sources that are better a representation of the data than these maximum likelihood models. Hmm. And the reason for that is the same the thing that you mentioned at the very beginning of the talk about priors. And the reason is that this network can learn the complex prior off of what a background source, what a galaxy really looks like from the training data set. Whereas when you try to define that in, you know, a statistical way from, you know, just, you know, in a, in a statistical way, it's just difficult. It's really difficult to define on a pixel per pixel basis. What is a galaxy? What does a galaxy look like? Right. If I show you something that, you know, has a little bit of you know more fluctuations here or a little bit spread out, you know what kind of score do you give it to say how galaxy you know galaxy looking like this is or this is not? Right. Whereas the neural networks they, they can learn that from the training data and perform really really well. 
Well, Yasha, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, share this with us. It's really interesting, really interesting work. I always love talking to folks that are working on astrophysics and cosmology in general. The use cases are so, just the scale of them is just enormous. Yeah, it's really fun talking to you. I didn't expect this to become uh, more like kind of a high level. I never thought, you know, about throwing the word CNN or RNN or things like that, but it was just fun for me to talk more technical stuff. Yeah. Nice. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Yasser. All right. Thank you. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. For more information on Yasher or any of the topics covered in this show, visit twomalai.com slash talk slash 250. Make sure to register for Pegaworld using the code twimmel 19 for $200 off of registration at pegaworld.com. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.